men. I want to speak about the church, the church's mission. Mission. The mission of the mission of the church. The mission of the church in this world. Men. Because the church has a mission. And as I many times mentioned, people think that the mission of the church is to be church and people look at the church as a building only, a house where people uh, stay. I need to see if this is recording or not. Okay. So the church mission, the mission of the church in this world, the history of the church of Christ is truly challenging. It started in Jerusalem, then moved throughout Judea and Samaria, as narrated in the biblical book of Acts, and has reached the ends of earth with, this, with its saying message for lost humanity. And since it started the church movement, and the church is a group of people chosen by Jesus, since it starts, the things weren't easy. But of course, the gospel that we hear in many churches, in many buildings, sometimes it's not that they are churches, it's just a building. The gospel that we hear, it's the gospel that offer us the opportunity to be prosper, offer us the opportunity to be happy, offer us the absence, the absence of problems, trials and tribulations, offer us all things that the Bible even don't describe it as an offer. God, Jesus never promised nothing as prosper, as good things, yet he says that the world perishes, but be brave or be joyful or motivate yourself because I overcome the world. He says that in this world we will have afflictions, things will afflict us. As Christians, we shouldn't be astonished when the affliction comes. We shouldn't. Because it's biblical. And then it's, if, if it's biblical, either we accept God's will or we not accept. But if it's biblical, so I need to accept it. And uh, Jesus never tells us that it will be easy. He says backwards. It is the Holy Spirit who is building this church throughout the ages and gives power to men to proclaim the person of Jesus Christ. Now we need the power of the Spirit of God. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit Himself in within us because of it. Because without Him, we have no power to proclaim the person of Jesus Christ. Because the spiritual forces of this world will entangle us in such a way that we'll, we won't be capable of even open the mouth to speak about Jesus. Before I became a pastor, uh, a Presbyterian church uh, appointed me or confirmed me or, you know, I don't know how you want to put this, or anoint me or ordain me as an evangelist. Before I became a pastor, I became an evangelist. And as an evangelist, I understood that even that I had the gifts of God within me, again, that's why the Apostle Paul says, you know what, Timothy, you need to revive the gift of God that is within you. And he says, it's not that I'm going to do it, you're going to do it. It's because of it, because many times the gift is within and we don't want. So many times even me, with the gift and with the Spirit of God, I got stuck in my words to preach the gospel. There is many ways of evangelizing. In those days I was evangelizing in the streets, stopping people and then start a conversation to lead to the plan of God and to speak about the love of Jesus. And we used to do this like every two to three times a week, me and Rita in a group in that church that we were congregating and doing missionary trips and on and on. And many times I felt that thing that it looks like that even to stop the first person would be difficult. Of course, then we overcame that because we understood the spiritual root of it. That many times even we could see, and my wife, she's hearing how many times we could be with our Bibles and 
in a circle speaking about so many things and the people are passing and we were losing the focus. Then we got the habit of jumping off that, that uh, conversation and you know guys we need to do this, we need to stop people, we need to speak about Jesus because this is what we are here for. And that was from one time to another. And that's why we need the power of Jesus Christ because the spiritual dark forces of this world they want to pull us down and even in many cases in many people like you and you will understand what I'm, what, why I'm putting out on myself many people like you you will think that this is my task this is for me this is for pastor this is for Lito which is a co-pastor already Kevin must start thinking about this and it's, this is for them not for me speak about Jesus empower people building people up no, that's not my calling. We need to preach about repentance as church and the forsaking of sins and baptize in the name of Jesus as a divine commandment. Thus forming a special people. Jealousy of God and good works or jealousy for God and good works that show the presence of God's love for humanity. As we can read in the well-known, let me fetch my Bible, well, if I read, even though that we all know by memory, our known verse, John chapter 3, verse 16, that says, For God loved the world so much that He gave His one only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Amen? Amen. This is God's love for humanity. So if you consider that people... People suffer in this world, people go through trials, through tribulations. We just need to consider the death of Jesus Christ on the cross of the Calvary. Even though that we go through days and through moments that are very tough, they will, they, they will never be compared with the toughness and roughness of that old cross. Never. So every, every time that us as Christians we go through something that is bad, it's heavy, it's a trial, it's a tribulation, it's, it's, it, it bothers, it hurts, either emotional, either physical, we need to consider always the cross of the Calvary. And what pain did he, did he went through? Our brother went through a process of very hard pain. Now imagine Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus? He got lashes, one of, one, of, one of the, how do you call that thing to lash? Whip. Le, uh, like a whip, a whip, yeah. One of the whip have three strings with bones. Bones ready to stick in the flesh and then when it takes out, it takes out flesh with. So if you got ten of those whips, which, which was more, was thirty-nine or whatever. Thirty-nine plus one. So imagine, now you multiply those 39 for 3. Because it was 3 whips in 1. And uh, imagine the pain. We couldn't do it. We couldn't. Pastor, you will die for me. I don't know even if I will die for my child. I'm not going to be hypocrite. I'm not going to be hypocrite. I cannot say that I will give my life. Maybe I, maybe I will, maybe I will, but I cannot say that. You know why I can say? Because I'm a human and th this level of deliverance, this level, this level of love, it's for Him. And it belongs to Him. Doesn't mean that a person couldn't be capable of it. The church began at the time when Jesus gave his life for us on the cross, was resur resurrected and ascended to heaven, pouring out his Holy Spirit on his disciples. If we read Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it's also a well-known verse, says, But those dates and times, sorry, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So he gives them a guideline. He says, in Jerusalem, 
Samaria and Jerusalem, sorry. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of earth. Now, many of us as church will want to start by the ends of earth. What do I want to try? What, what I'm trying to say with this? You need to start where you start. Here is where you start. And we need to respect the start. Sometimes in the start, we want to be over there when it's time to be here. And God will lead you through the Judea of your life, the Samaria of your life, and then the ends of earth of your life. And this applies to every platform of your life. That's why many of you that came to Riyadh, you come to Riyadh, and after one week two, you want to, to jump to a platform that you need to wait a space and time for it. But you want now. And that's the characteristic of us, addicts. Either alcoholics, either, either alcoholics, either drug addicts, that's the characteristic we have. We want to start and we want to start, we want the things and we want them now. And we are not capable to wait. This was the requirement for his mission. They were commanded to gather together, have fellowship with one another, pray and share the word of God to everyone, everywhere. This was, this was what we read in Acts 1.8. Also, we can say that Jesus said, go into the entire world and preach the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe is already condemned. Then he doesn't mention the baptism. A few days ago I said to somebody, you don't need to be, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. There is there any biblical explanation for this? Who knows? Huh? The Bible says if you believe in your heart, then you are saved. If you believe in Jesus Christ, no. you accept it. I, go, I, I want something much simple, but that's correct. But I want something much simple. Those two thieves in the cross next to Jesus, they were baptized? No. no. One of them, he didn't even want nothing with, to do with Jesus. So that one we knew that he was already condemned. But one said, you know what, this, this man here, he did nothing, but we did. He never failed, but we failed. He does not deserve any, any level of condemnation, but we deserve. Sir, please, remember me when you enter in your kingdom. For God's sake, please. Jesus didn't say, hey, let's stop everything now. Pull him down the cross, let me baptize him, and then... No. So the baptism, it's, it's in the end of the day, I always say, what is already done within you. So you can even be baptized, but maybe something never happened within you. The baptism is like a coin, has a face, has, 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 has two sides. I don't know how to say in English, kare krua, has two sides. If you shape one of the sides with a grinder, the coin will, lost, it will lose its yeah. value. It's no good for nothing. The, the same with the baptism. For the baptism you need both sides of the coin, both sides of the baptism. The first side is when I say, you know, I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I accept Him in my life, in my heart, and my life from now on is His, or is yours, God. That is the first side of the baptism. The second is when I go publicly in the waters to, to, for the old man to die and then publicly I'm saying and stating what happened already within me, in my heart. But he says something, go to the entire world and preach the gospel. Now this is something that you need the Spirit of God to do it. You need to be filled with God himself in order for you to be even pushed to do it. To announce the gospel, to preach the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe is already condemned. 
So that led me to the conclusion, or lead us to the conclusion, that God does not send anyone to hell. Anyone. So how does this work? He died for us. He, gave us, he shared an invitation for us to receive him as Lord and Savior. And then we receive yes or no. So if we don't receive who does not believe, I'm already condemned. I go to hell by my own choice. But the disciples, they were also commanded to manifest that presence of Jesus who lived in them and still lives forever through each of his followers. And in this experience and coexistence, men were and are saved and also transformed by the power of the love of God. Created again for a different life with love for God and their neighbor. And where a church is planted, that is supposed to be the light of the testimony of Christ and the balance for a society in decay. We need to create balance. We need to create equilibrium. Because the society is in decay. The society is fallen. Each and every day we see. Today, Sandra was saying, what is happening with this generation? Is this is just Africa? And we said, no, it's, 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 it's general. It's everywhere. The society is just moving astray. And this couple that congregate with us in the church here, that they, Roxy and Martinez, né? Roxy works in Rio Douro. In the morning I was telling her, me and Rita, that God still allowed the society to go move astray because Jesus went to the cross of the Calvary. Otherwise it wouldn't make any sense that, that big sacrifice. In the times of Sodom and Gomorrah, that now is much worse, but in the times of Sodom and Sodom, Sodom, Gomorrah, what God did, it just exterminates, isn't it? I'm done. I am done. But in our days, Jesus, God says, you know what? I won't exterminate you because Jesus went to the cross to die in your place. So either you sin more and more, either the society go more and more astray, moves astray more and more every day, even though I won't exterminate because Jesus went to the cross. And this is for you to have the opportunity of repentance. Today I read something, I was reading a few things and I read something that and I put in my phone even, I think, I don't know if I post in the church, but I want to post in the church, which is repentance is not when you cry, but when you change. Although the church has survived much persecution from the religions of the time and of all times, They used to have the Colosseum, the Colosseum, no? Colosseum. Colosseum. And lions were there, Anger, angry lions. And they used to throw the Christians to the lions. Now this leads us to think, what a price. What a price those brothers and sisters, they were paying for the sake of the gospel. Now that leads us to the question, that what price are you paying? What price are you paying? Because those are the martyrs of, of those days. And the Bible speaks about Stephen and speaks about many people. And the way the apostles died, the way the apostles died, Peter was crucified, isn't it? Upside down. Because he understood that to be crucified like Jesus is it's the honor is for him. So he, he said upside down. So what is the price are we paying? Is this church? This is to be the church? A church that cries for everything? The Bible says that God gave, gave us a spirit of, of, of power and self-control. But we live sometimes as a church that is fearful. We live under fear. We like to be in comfort, in, a, in my cushy land, where nobody can trouble me. A church that can complain about everything and nothing is okay. But 
The question remains, is this the church? Are we the church? Is the church meant to be like this? Or the church needs to be beyond the community, but also individually somebody that prays and somebody that comes down to the feet of Jesus every day, somebody that is ready to comfort and ready to speak about God and about Jesus, somebody that when it starts speaking about God and Jesus, there is power coming in fire. No, that ministry is just for the pastor and the wife and the ministers, not for me. Not for me. The church, it has grown and expanded because it is not a project of man, but a project of God. And it is the same yesterday, today and forever. It doesn't change. Of course, he continues to heal, deliver and work miracles and wonders. Can somebody check the dog there, please? Miracles and wonders among his people. For the good news of the gospel remains unchanged. Your mission does not change by virtue of the times, seasons or epoch, epics. The church is the body of Christ in this world until the day determined by God to come and get his church. The main purpose of our life is to bring out Christ in us. If we read Matthew chapter 5 verse 6, you can go there. I like to hear the, the Bible paper moving. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, the Bible says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that, let your light, let your good works or let the people see, uh, let the people see your good works. It says, let your light shine. And because of that, people will be able to see your good works. So what Jesus wants to say with this pastor? He wants to see, say that they will be able to identify that th those works are godly and not men. Because the light will shine. There is always a moment that the light of Jesus has to shine in our lives. It must be always a moment that people must look at you and I and say, you know, now I saw Jesus in the life of this person. You, we cannot do this at every second, hour, minutes, because we fail. Because we offend each other, because we bump into each other. But there is always moments that we must be able to identify the man of God within you or the woman of God. And all this to glorify the Father which is in heaven. Also in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I like to, I love this verse. I love, I just love it. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Pastor Luis also spoke about this verse when he preached last Sunday, if you remember. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Created in Christ Jesus. It means that we were created, our, our nature, we born normal, we grow up, and then when we receive Jesus, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should. You know why we should? Because some we don't walk in them. Some instead of we walk in them, we sit in the church waiting for a preacher, a pastor, a minister to prepare the food, go to the pick up the Bible, prepare the food, the scripture, and then come and feed you by the mouth. When the church of Christ fulfills its mission, its mission preaches the gospel. It teaches the whole counsel of God through the Holy Bible. Practice caring and helping those around it, around it with their needs. It's a very simple mission. Preaching the gospel. What, what is the gospel? It's the good news. 
what are, what are the good news? The good news is that we can gain eternal life through Jesus Christ. And then comes all the package of it. So we have to preach the gospel. We need to teach the whole Bible. Not part of the Bible, not some verses, the whole Bible. Pre teach the Bible. The counsel of God through the, whole Bi the Holy Bible. And we need to practice care, which is love, and helping those around it with their needs. Now, this of practicing love, it's a difficult one. Because the perception we have about love is that we think that love is something that is connected to our emotions. And love is nothing, doesn't have nothing to do with your or my emotions. Love has to do with our actions. Love it doesn't have nothing to do with me saying, I love you. Love has to do with me serving you and attending you. For that I don't need words. I need actions. The Bible says in John 3.16, we read already, God loved the world that He gave. He didn't come and say, you know what? He doesn't say God loved the world and He came to the world and said, I love you guys. No. He loved the world and He gave. He shows His love by giving. He shows His love with an action. Caring and helping those around it with their needs. When people are more important than I. When your need is more important than my need. When I forget my things, my needs, in order to assist yours. Jesus did this in his public ministry. And the church must do it too. We go then later to Martin for Matthew 14 and 15, if you want to start opening. Matthew 14 and 15. We won't go there, but okay, you can, keep, you can stay in Matthew. <laughs> the basis of the gospel is still the same. It's still the same in what? Let man love God above all things and his neighbor as himself. It's a vertical love and then a horizontal love. If you can't do this, you won't be able to do that. If you can't love your neighbor as you love yourself, see, love, go, love goes and then come back. If this can't have, is not capable of happening, then you can, do, you can say that you love someone higher than you. Love God above all things, above all things. But then love your neighbor as yourself. If you don't love yourself, you will never love your neighbor. If you live with a subject on, in your life by any chance, if I'm speaking to somebody tonight, if you are not capable to love yourself, you can't love anyone else. It's impossible. You can pretend. You can, you can do a, a, a sort of a theater around it. That people will believe that I love indeed my neighbor. But it will be like a strange fire. A fake fire. There is candles and there is lights today that they look like candles. They can be... We can put candle lights here. Globes that they look like a fire. A candle that is on. And it's not. It's fake. And sometimes our love, it can be fake. We pretend that we love, but we actually don't love. So that's why it says that first we love, I love my neighbor first. But I need to love my neighbor as I love myself. So now you, you just do the mathematics. If, if I have to love my neighbor as I love myself, if I don't love myself, it means that I won't be capable of loving my neighbor. And on and on, then I, I can't be capable to love God above all things. In Matthew 25, 34, 45, Jesus, teach, Jesus teaching about the accountability of our stewardship for the goods, talents and abilities that God has given us. And he's very explicit. We all have a life and possessions to manage. 
and we need the divine ability to manage them until one day we stand before the owner, the Lord of all. And Matthew chapter 25, verse 34, 2 to 45 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee angry and feed thee? Or thirsty, and we gave you a drink? And when did we see you, a foreigner, and lodge you, or naked and dressed you? And when did we see you sick, or in prison, come to see you? And the king answering will say to them, Truly I say to you, in as, in as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And this is what Rima NGO and then, of course, body of Messiah is in church. This is what Rimar is all about. Dressing, <coughs> visiting the prisoners, accepting the needy. When you came, in many, in many of you, we ask you for a donation fee. Today I spoke with a young man now by the phone, then Justin finalizes the, the last touch-ups, and he told me, I cannot give you a donation fee because I'm fully unemployed and I have nothing. Then I, asked, I said, so what about this sister that calls? Can she assist you with that donation fee? No, she can't because she's also unemployed and she also, she's broke. So what does that mean? I said, it means that you can come because it's not about the donation fee. It's about your life, it's about your recovery. But how many are here that with or not donation fee, you came and wasn't too many questions asked. We didn't want to know much about you. We didn't want to know the historical, your history comes then when we start dealing with you. But in order to heal you, to take care of you, we start dealing with your stories and your problems. And you start trying to make corrections in order to take you to a good path. But we didn't ask you much questions if you are rich, if you have the whole qualifications and on and on and on. We didn't ask you. The gospel is an incentive for men to live with a new heart, a heart of Christ. There is no gospel without compassion in action, without kindness, without kindness to the next. And someone say, how can you call God Father if you do not see your neighbor or your brother? Unfortunately, many have neglected the words of Jesus and have made their own gospel, ending up serving as a stumbling block and a scandal for the world, exploiting, exploiting even the poorest with their false ideologies. For instance, the prosperity gospel and its philosophies. For instance, the prosperity gospel, it's to confuse the masses. That's why if I see a big mega church full of people, you know, the, even, even, even those preachers, they want to make you understand that just because my church is full, it means that there is blessing. It's blessing in his bank account. Amen. Not in your bank account. Not in their bank account. It's blessing in his bank account. So it's not about filling the church. It's about filling the heaven. <laughs> the Bible speaks of good works that accompany, accompany those who are truly Christ or in Christ and are used by him to help their fellow men, especially those most in need. The prisoners, the sick, the homeless, the angry, the rejected, the desperate, the, the drug addict, the alcoholic, those who have no one to help them must be a priority of the church, charity and work. 
It is the, it is the hand of God that reaches out to them. We live in a world with so much injustice that one day you will, you will have to face the just judgment and the just judge. The church, however, is alive and vivified to be a transmitter, a transmitter of good news and good works. And the church will certainly be rewarded for what the church did for the world on her time. If this message from Christ moves you and moves me, you or I, we are alive and on the way, which is Christ. Because we are all on the way to Christ. That's why, and these days, unfortunately, we have been dealing with that. But that is something that mankind deals at a daily basis. It's an everyday thing. Just the target, the family target, it's different. But every day someone loses someone. But us as Christians, we must observe that as, as a benefit. The Apostle Paul says that that for me, it's a gain. It's a reward. It means that I, as a man of God's own wish, it's not that I want to die now, but I must look at that as something that is a reward. And then it doesn't matter how it's going to happen, but it must be like a reward. Because I'm on the way to Christ. And those that are already in Christ, I'm telling you now, they're much better than you and I. This is not a cliche, church. This is not a cliche. The presence of God that we experiment many times in this church. When the glory of God comes, you must multiply that for 500 billion times. That is, that is the heaven. For the eternity. You don't want to leave that place. You won't get tired. You have no schedule. You are not busy to do nothing. You don't need to go to your bed. You won't feel your body because you will have a body of light. You will have your, a body of light and you will be yourself in that body of light, purified from all sin, free away from every injustice, free away from every pain, every sorrow. Nothing will be there. It will be just in the glory. The Bible says that the angels, they worship the Lord. For it's 24-7. They don't get tired because also they are spiritual beings. So they don't get tired. They don't sweat, they don't get chubby, they don't have pain in the knees, and now today I work so much, I can't be here, oh, you know God, now I need to go to my bed. No, they are there now as we speak, for the eternity. And this is the reward of the children of God. This is the reward of those that wait in the Lord, is that we will be able to worship and praise and honor and glorify God without any imposition, without any requisite, because we just want to be in His presence, because we were meant to be in His presence. Eden was Eden because God was created, uh, uh, Adam was created by God to be with God in His presence. That's why Eden was so special, because in Eden, God would come to Adam and Adam would feel and see and be with God. The Bible never says that Adam saw God. The Bible says that no man saw God. But I believe that Adam was a different man from us. We became as we are because of our sin. Because Adam, the Bible says what? That God will will come to him in the turnout of the day, in the end of the day, in the evening, God will come and, how are you, Adam? What you have been doing today? Show me. So we can conclude that maybe that Adam, in the shape that God created him without sin, maybe that Adam were able to see God. Because the reason we cannot see God is because of our sin. We wouldn't stand. So if this message from Christ moves you, 
you are alive and on the way, which is Christ. Give yourself to Him first and let Him guide you to be. But...